All right, so uh, this is the topic for the last two lectures in the course, um, and we're actually only talking about one paper, which is a well-known paper by a couple of economists named uh, Opsfeld and Rogoff about uh, six puzzles in, um, in international macro. So the title of this course is Macroeconomics and the Global Economy, but if you've noticed, so far everything we've talked about has really been about a single economy. So we want to talk now about something that relates economies together. Um, so these two lectures are it. Um, and uh, yeah, so kind of the point of this paper is to bring up these facts uh, about these empirical sort of regularities about the world that seem somewhat puzzling and then try to explain them uh, using one sort of one factor, which I'll just spoil the surprise right now and say that that factor is trade costs. So basically, Obsfeld and Rogoff are going to claim that there's these six puzzles that seem difficult to explain, but if we include trade costs in models of macro, and that's trade costs on goods and services, not trade costs on, on uh, capital, uh, then we can actually go a long way to explaining all of these puzzles. So without further ado, let me just briefly describe what the puzzles are. And then uh, we're going to go through each of the puzzles in detail. Today, I think we're going to go through, in this lecture, we're going to go through three of them. And then in the, in the following lecture, we're going to go through the last three. Is that right? Or are we going to go through two today? And well, anyway, we're going we're gonna to cover them all in two lectures. Um, so, uh, what are these puzzles? So the first one is called home bias in trade. So if you look at um, if you look at a country like Denmark, uh, this is probably a bad example because I don't have it off the top of my head. But uh, you know, Denmark is a very small country, and of course, it's because it's small, it's it's trading a lot with the rest of the world. And you might think that because it's so so small. The volume of trade or you know what danes consume would be largely produced abroad um, but that's not actually true so something like 50 percent of what danes consume is actually produced in denmark um, and that's that's true i don't know if it, the 50 percent i'm not sure if it's true but the um but danes consume all, even if i mean so there's some things like haircuts right so it's, it's very hard to consume a imported haircut or a uh, you know imported restaurant meal if you're sitting in Denmark. Although uh, if you do go to a foreign country and have a restaurant meal there, that's considered an import into Denmark in national accounts. But in any case, um, even if we look at things that are tradable, so that's goods that could be traded, um, even if we look at those, it turns out that Danes consume a lot of goods that are produced in Denmark, much more than proportional to sort of the size of Denmark relative to the size of the rest of the world or the size of Europe. Um, so I'll be more specific about that in just a couple of slides, but what we mean by or why that's puzzling. Um, and then go from there. The second one, the Feldstein, Feldstein Horoika puzzle um, is about investment uh, diversification. So we would expect that people, when they're investing their money, you know, that what they're after is the highest return or the highest return conditional on uh, some sort of volatility measure. Um, but if that were true, then it wouldn't matter which country you're in. You'd want to have sort of the same portfolio of diversified investments. Or, you know, it might be going a bit too far to say the same portfolio, but you'd expect people to have sort of a similar portfolio. Um, of investments around the world, regardless of which country they're living in, based simply on return and risk and, and stuff like that. Um, but it turns out that if we look at just aggregate statistics on national investment and aggregate statistics on national savings, we find quite a strong correlation there, seeming to imply that people invest um, domestically more than, you know, they might if they were acting optimally in terms of diversifying their portfolio. So um, that's actually kind of two and three here and even four actually are all sort of wrapped around the same sort of issue, which is that people seem to invest at home. Not only do they consume things that are produced at home, 
they also tend to invest their money at home, even though you know, it's quite easy to invest abroad. It's very easy in Denmark, say, you know, my own personal investments, most of them I hold in a market tracking mutual fund. Um, so it's a mutual fund that invests a little bit in shares of companies all over the world, basically. Um, I'm, side, I'm thinking that I read actually that last year they changed the rules on a particular type of investment instrument called an ETF, and I should rethink my investment strategy, but I keep putting it off. Um, but anyway, whatever. So, um, so uh, yeah, so it's, it's a bit puzzling that Danes invest in Denmark. You know, you'd think that would be exactly what you don't want to do. Your labor income is, is in Denmark. You'd think you should invest abroad even more proportionally than, you, you know, the size of your country relative to abroad. But, um, but it turns out that people tend to invest at home a lot, which is somewhat surprising. All right. Um, and then, so three is obviously a case of that. And then four is also related, which is that um, we might expect that across countries, if people are all diversifying their investments, you know, their GDPs might do all kinds of different things. You know, some countries might be more productive than others, but you might expect that consumption would sort of grow at the same rate if people were just diversifying their risk, regardless of which country they're sitting in, since there's no... Uh, big barriers to uh, to investing abroad. You know, you don't have to live in the United States to benefit from the growth of American countries. You can just invest um, and still live in Denmark. It would be the idea. So those are all sort of two, three, four are all very closely related, and then um, sort of one, two, three, four are all quote real puzzles about the real economy. You know, how much people save. What do they consume? And then five and six are about prices. So, and, and they're also, five and six are very closely related. Um, so basically exchange rates tend to be extremely volatile. They fluctuate all over from day to day. Uh, so um, if we compare exchange rates to price levels in countries, so we have ways of making price indices in a country, the most famous one is probably the consumer price index, which is supposed to reflect the price of a particular basket of consumption that's supposed to be the same across time and across locations. Um, you know, if we look at the difference between uh, how much it costs to buy this basket in different countries, and in some countries buying that basket of goods is cheaper, if you've ever been to a uh, developing country, uh, then you'll notice that the same sort of things you could buy here in Denmark are, are cheaper. Um, so, we, you know, we can look at sort of the price of that basket in the developing country, compare it to the price of the basket in Denmark, and that difference there is going to imply an exchange rate because you could always arbitrage. You could, you could buy the goods in the developing country and then sell them in Denmark. Um, but anyway... Um, I feel like I'm sort of getting off track here. But anyway, the, the point is that if we look at how much that ratio of um, the price of these baskets, how much does that change over time? It turns out that that's not that volatile. That stays relatively stable over time. Of course, it, it does change, but it changes slowly. Whereas exchange rates are just fluctuating all the time. So whatever sort of implied arbitrage condition you have, it seems like it's constantly being violated by these... Um, by these quickly fluctuating exchange rates, and it's hard to explain why. And then six is just kind of the same thing. If we look at GDPs of countries or any sort of macroeconomic variable, um, they tend to the ratio tends to fluctuate a lot less than the exchange rate, which seems somewhat difficult to explain what's causing these fluctuations in the exchange rate. Okay, so that's kind of the first dip into these six puzzles. And then basically these two lectures, we're going to go into each one of them in turn um, and then uh, try to see if we can explain or understand what's behind these, these puzzles in terms of uh, trade costs and goods and services.